preaching after worship, unless something like that happens, then I hate preaching after worship like that. Y'all know what I'm talking about, when the spirit is just moving in a place, and and then you got a bumper video, right? But uh, man, it's so good to be with you. Um, I know y'all know Pastor Adam, his church, such a heart for God. He's one of these guys that's the real deal, loves the Lord. It's an honor to be here, man. Thank you for having me. Um, where's uh, the, the two pastors, the church planners that and pastors that just spoke? On there, both of y'all said things that just ministered to me. Um, where's Pastor Chris? Back there, bro. I, like, I, I might have just got saved during that just a second ago, man. I'd be like, like, for real, like, you know how I know that I know I'm a Christian is because when I hear stuff like that, everything within me is like, that is the truth. I love Jesus. Thank, so thank you for that, brother. So, and then Travis, our worship leader, just made a statement. He said, we need less prophets you know, throwing stones at the church. I'm gonna talk about something that I believe is a problem in, in the church in North America. I say that, and I want you to know that I've more than given my pound of flesh for the bride of Christ. Spent 30 years as a, as a pastor of a local church and, um, and just left. After 30 years, I'm now the vice president at Sin Network, oversee church planning. But one of the things I've gotten to do is I've spent a lot of time with pastors and everything you're hearing about pastors struggling is true. It's true. Met with a guy named William Vanderblom the other day. He's kind of a, a pastor headhunter, connects pastors to churches. I said, man, is this is really true? Are guys really hurting out there? He said, Matt, it's, it's bigger than you would imagine. He spent a week, a couple weeks ago with eight megachurch guys, guys that are pastors from the largest churches in America, the guy leading our time said, would you raise your hand if you've lost a top three best friend in the last two years, either to death or conflict? Folks, every single one of them in the room raised their hand. It's a real thing. It's a difficult time to be a pastor, and so I love you and respect you and thank God for you, but we need to talk about the bride of Christ. And I want to I want to talk about the problem that I'm seeing in it. We've got several, but I want to talk about one tonight. I want to talk about what I think, my humble opinion, we need to do. But here's the here's the problem. Here's the problem facing us as a nation, as a church in that nation, is that, and you guys know this, but I, I want to take a couple of minutes and remind us of this tonight. But the younger generation of Americans, when I say Americans, I'm talking about North America, the the younger generation of Americans, that's millennials, Gen Z, younger Gen X, younger generations of Americans are leaving the church at a record pace. They're leaving the church at a record pace. And when I took this job, <clears throat> as vice president of Sin Network, church planning, I'd heard all the stats and stuff, but I'm like, I'm actually gonna do the research myself, see if this stuff is made up, are they, is that just urban legend? Is this really happening? And so I did a deep dive in it. I wanted to show you a couple things that I found. Again, y'all probably heard this stuff, but just I want you to feel it tonight. Here's the first one that I found. This is in 2020, so this was a couple years ago. The percentage of Americans who qualify as practicing Christians has dropped from 50% in 2009 to 25% in 2020 with church attendance dropping most precipitously among millennials. So let's stop and just look at that for a second and let that sink in. From 2009 to 2020, in the span of 11 years, the percentage of Americans that would call themselves practicing Christians has dropped by half in a decade. In one single decade, it's dropped by half. That's, that's significant. That's not even counting 
like 21, 22, and 23. This is fascinating. I didn't know this. This is from, by the way, that, that last stat was from Barna. This one's from Lifeway. <clears throat> it says a record low, 20% of Americans, now say the Bible is the literal word of God, down from 24% the last time the question was asked in 2017, and half of what it was at its high point in the 1980s. And so I'll just sum all that up for you. As of July of 2021, four out of five Americans do not think that the Bible is the literal, literal word of God. Now think about the implications of that in our, in our society for our children. Think about that. Um, our biblical understanding of sexuality and marriage and gender, like we are in the vast minority. And if, unless there is a revival in our country, our children could grow up and not four out of five people don't, but maybe one out of 10 Things are heading in the wrong direction. And there's one more stat that I thought was interesting that I'll share with you because we've got a lot of church planners in here, a lot of pastors and church leaders and elders. In 2019, in 2019, the number of Protestant churches that closed their doors overtook the number of churches that were planted. That's the first time that's happened since they've been studying it. Just a few years ago, 2019, the number of churches that closed surpassed the number of churches that were open. Friends, the point I'm trying to make is that as we stand tonight, we're heading in the wrong direction. We're heading in the wrong direction and we're heading there fast. And, and I want that to sink in deep into your heart tonight because I think we need to do something about it. I think we need to make a shift and a course correction. And here's what, here's what hit me as I, as I studied this. This was the one big takeaway is that in the last 10 years in our country, last 10 years in North America, we have seen the greatest statistical decline in the history of our country. Now, last 10 years, greatest statistical decline in the history of our country, and here's what just punched me in the gut. It just, it's just something so simple. Never thought about it before, but it punched me in the gut when I thought about it. Guys, that happened on our watch. Let that sink in. The greatest statistical decline Christians in the history of the United States happened on our watch. Okay? And here's the question. Why? Why is, why, why is that happening? Well, I think there, there are a lot of reasons. There are a lot of reasons. But we need, we need to be asking ourselves that question. If you're a leader of a church in this room, you have got to ask yourself that question. Why is that occurring? Why is our generation so ineffective, if you will, at impacting the culture with the gospel of Jesus? So let's process it for a second. And if we try to get to the bottom, like, why is that happening? I know there's a lot of cultural things, but let's just look at it from the perspective of the church. Why is that happening? Maybe, maybe we just need more theological training. Maybe that's what we need. And look, I love theological training. I'm a big believer in it. I've, I've gone to seminary more years than, than like my kids have been alive. I, I love theological training, but it, it hit me as I thought about this that, that we live in a culture that because of the internet and online learning, they've got, they've got greater access to more and better theological training than any generation in the history of the world. So I don't think that's, that's the reason. Well, maybe we're being so ineffective at reaching our culture for the gospel because maybe people just don't have enough access to the message of the gospel. Maybe that's it. But then I thought, well, that can't be true because there's our, the people out there through the internet, they have more access to good preaching and to podcasts and worship music and books and blogs and Christian articles and Christian movies, for crying out loud, and Christian TV more so than any other generation in the history of our country. So that really can't be the reason why Christianity is declining so rapidly right now. And then I thought, well, maybe, maybe it's because we need more megachurches. Maybe we need more megachurches. I mean, megachurches are awesome. And by the way, I, I pastored one. I planted one. I started a church in 2002 called the Austin Stone. 
And we saw it grow. It got really big. It had a bunch of multiple campuses, and God did some unbelievable things. And so I love megachurch, but maybe that's what we need to turn our country around is more mega churches. Matter of fact, if we were going to come up with a missional strategy to reach the United States, maybe that's what we ought to do. What if, like, we got a bunch of churches here, Adam. What if, what if we decided, like, hey, we're going to get all our money together and we're going to, we're going to raise up a, a bunch of young church planners and over the next 20 years, all of us here are going to pull our money. We're going to, we're going to plant 2,000 mega churches over the next 20 years. That's going to be our missional strategy. You think, well, that would reach the country for Christ. We could plant 2,000 megachurches in the next 20 years. That would reach our country for Christ, right? Well, the answer is no. And you know how I know that? Because that's exactly what we just got finished doing over the last 20 years. And there are, we, we planted around 2,000 megachurches in North America over the last 20 years. And there are less people per capita going to church today than there was 20 years ago. Here's, here's what I'm getting at. Our missional strategy is not working. It's working in countries all over the place. Like there's stuff's blowing up all over the world, but it's not in our country. Our missional strategy is not working the way that we're kind of doing church here in the United States is not reaching the culture for Christ. Now, you may be thinking what I would be thinking if I was sitting in your seat. Be thinking, well, my, my church isn't the problem. My church isn't the problem because, like, we're growing. We're, we're, we're growing. Like, man, we're all, like, we're all the way up to, like, pre-COVID numbers. Or, you know, have you seen our online attendance? It's, it's rocking. You might be thinking, well, man, you know, our giving is better than it's ever been. I've heard that a ton over the last couple of years as I've hung out with pastors. Giving's up. Maybe, maybe just built a new building. Maybe you already built a building and it's already full and you're already thinking about the next building. You know, all that stuff is great. All that stuff is awesome and is good, and you need to grow your church. And buildings are awesome, and, and budgets, it's growing them are amazing. But what if I were to tell you that in my humble opinion, that strategy alone, that philosophy of ministry alone is the reason that the church in North America is declining? And you say, what do you mean? What philosophy of ministry? And here it is. The philosophy of ministry that I believe is one of the primary reasons the church in North America is declining is this philosophy of ministry. The philosophy of ministry that defines success by how many people we can get to come to our church. And that's where it is. The philosophy of ministry, no matter what you want to call it, that's what it is. That the idea is we want to try to get as many people as we can to come to our church. If that's where your philosophy of ministry stops, I really do believe that that's part of the problem. And guys, here's the deal. I've been there. I've been there. It starts off really, really pure. You plant the church, and it is all about Jesus, man, you move to this city, and it's this pagan city. I, I planted in Austin, Texas, pagan city. It's pagan, and you're, man, you're just praying every night. You're praying every night because you want to feed your family, and you don't know if it's going to work, so you're just all dependent on God, and you just want to see people come to Christ, and you, it's all about Jesus. But then, man, stuff starts creeping in there. And all of a sudden, you start thinking about stuff like bigger budgets because, and you would never admit this publicly. Bigger budgets means bigger salary, means nicer stuff, means larger ministry platform, applause of your congregation, applause of your leadership team, all that stuff, man. It's, it creeps in in subtle ways, and we have to be so careful 
about it. But here's the thing. Listen, again, I love the megachurch. There are things that God can do in megachurches if they're centered on Christ and they're centered on his mission that, that are unbelievable. I've been a part of them. But here's the thing. I want to be clear. I want to be super clear that if your definition of success is simply to grow your church and that's where it ends. And you're part of the problem and not the solution. And so what do, what do we do? What do we do? Number one, I'm gonna tell you two things super fast, camp out for a second on a third one. I just if you ask me if we're hanging out at coffee, say, man, what do we need to do? I would give you, I'd give you three fast things. Here's number one. And you don't even have to take notes. You can just remember this one real easy. We need to pray more. I'm going to get some water while y'all think about that one. And I know, like, when somebody says that, you're like, yeah, yeah. And everything within you knows you need to do it, and you need to lead your people to do it. Why aren't we doing it? I think there's something about prayer that the enemy does not like. And I think that's a big reason why we don't do it near as much as we need to, privately and corporately. But what I've sort of discovered in church world today is we spend so, I want you to hear this, we spend so much time on leadership and strategies and systems that we've divorced ourselves from the power that is able to bring about actual change through our strategy and systems and leadership. Got to come back to the place where we are seeking the face of God and his power and bring back the spirit of almighty God in our churches and that's when revival is going to come. Amen. I think number two is we need, to, we need to get back to preaching the word of God. We need to get back to preaching the word of God. Listen, um, in my experience after pastoring for 30 years, my cultural, nobody ever came to Christ through my amazing cultural wisdom. It never happened one time. I don't think anybody ever came to Jesus because of my cool illustrations. Never saw somebody come to Christ because of, of my humor. But what I did see people come to Christ through is when I stood up and I preached the living, active Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God. And that's why the Apostle Paul, this is so biblical. Apostle Paul says, I did not come to you in persuasive words of wisdom, but I came to you in spirit and in power so that your faith, your faith would not rest on the wisdom of man, but your faith would rest on the power of Almighty God. There is a way that you can preach that your people's faith will rest on your wisdom. And there's a way that you can preach where your people's faith will rest on the power of God. And the only guarantee that your people's faith is going to rest on the power of God is when you're preaching the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God. Amen. We need to get back to prayer, get on our face, and begging God to show up in power. And we need to preach the Word. And here's the last one. I think we need to change the definition of success of the American church. I think we need to change the definition of success of the American church. Right now, don't shout it out, but like, if you're just honest, what would you say we measure success by in the local church? Pastors, when we get together, what do y'all talk about? And what I've found is that we measure success. We have a tendency to measure, measure success on, on a couple of metrics, but primary is the church growing. Is the, does, does the church have an increasing number of people coming to it? And if it's growing, just whether or not, I mean, there's other things, but the thing that we kind of focus on is like, if it is it growing? And we have a tendency to say that is a 
successful church. And I think deep down inside, again, in places we don't want to talk about or admit, that's kind of the goal of most church teams and pastors and leaders and elder boards is we want to grow our church. And that's a good thing. You should want to grow your church. I want you to grow your church. But here's, in my opinion, how we need to change the definition of success of the American church. I think if we're just honest, the definition of success right now for the American church is to be a mega church. If you grow to 2,000 people, you're like, all right, they're doing, they're doing well. I think we need to change. Last thing I'll say here about this is that we need to change our definition of success in the American church from being a mega church, and we need to start defining success as a multiplying church. I know that's so simple. That when pastors get together, when leadership teams get together, when staff gets together, and we start thinking about, man, is this church crushing it? Is this church doing its thing? Is this church growing? Is God's hand on it? It's not if people are coming to the church, but are people coming to the church, getting equipped, and then being sent out from their church into the harvest that desperately needs it? I think we need to start defining success that way in the local church. And so here's just a couple couple differences here between a, a mega church and a multiplying church. And I know there's home church folks in here, and y'all are crushing it. I love y'all, but let's just talk to everybody else. It's like trying to grow their own church here. Here we go. There's a couple differences between mega church and a multiplying church. First one's super simple. Mega church, defined. It's 2,000 people or more. Multiplying church can be any size. That's the brilliance of it. It can be any size. You can be tiny Medium, large, and you can be a multiplying church. Mega church has to grow really big. Number two, this is not always the case, but it's more often than not the case. A mega church is, off, uh, is often inwardly focused. Mega church is often inwardly focused. We didn't start that way, but it started creeping that way at the end of my time at the stone. So mega church is often inwardly focused. But a multiplying church is always outwardly focused. Always outwardly focused. Number three, a mega church more often than not will produce me focused consumers. A multiplying church always raises up kingdom focused difference makers. Now, here's where number four and five is where the rubber starts to meet in the road here. A mega church measures success by how many people they can get to come to their church and stay. A multiplying church measures success by how many people they can send from their church into the mission field. Number five, a mega church gets fired up when they grow their attendance and their budget, but a multiplying church gets fired up when they grow the number of churches they plant and missionaries they send into unreached people groups. And finally, and I think this is, this is the big one, biggest difference. A mega church over the course of a few decades has the potential to reach thousands of people for the kingdom of God. It is. Mega church over the course of a few decades has the potential to reach thousands of people for the kingdom of God, but a multiplying church has the potential over the course of several decades to reach thousands of people and then release thousands of people who will in turn reach millions of people for the kingdom of God. That's the difference. That's the difference. So the question I want to ask you guys is, like, is this idea of being a multiplying church, of, of, of not measuring our success by how many people we can get to come hear us preach or come to our programs, but measuring success by how many people we can get to come be trained and discipled and then sit out into the harvest? Is that a biblical thing? Real fast, three scriptures, I'm done. I'm going to fly through them. Ephesians 4.11, you know these. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And so right there, Paul says, look, God gave the church people like us. God gave the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, preachers, and teachers. What's our job? What's our job as a pastor, prophet, evangelist, preacher, teacher? He says in 411, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Why? To equip his people for the work of ministry. Why did God raise up folks like us? It's so we will equip the saints for the work of ministry. Do your people know that? That they view themselves as ministers. 
Simple question. Ephesians 4, 15. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it's equipped. Watch this. It says, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow. What is the, what is the scripture say causes real church growth? What does the scripture say? What does the Holy Spirit inspired word of God say is gonna cause real church, body of Christ growth? It says when each and every part is working properly. I'm talking about every part of your church. I'm talking about the 58-year-old guy sitting in the back that just retired, has more money than he knows what to do with. And the, his, his big thing for the week is he's gonna, you know, he's gonna go work, work in the parking lot. And that's great. We need people in the parking lot. But does he, does he view himself as, himself as a minister of the gospel? That he's being trained and equipped by you for the work of the ministry. That college kid, that college kid that has the, the Holy Spirit inside of them that, that has the capacity and the passion and the time for crying out loud to change the world. Is the big measure of success for them just to, to come to a program or, or, or are they, do they view themselves as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ? They're coming to your church so that they can be trained and equipped and sent out into the world for the glory of God. All the way through, ask yourself that question. And then last one here, Ephesians 3.20. Now to him. And we've all heard this. And we have tendency to just let it glaze over us. But there's something in here that just messed me up on it. Paul says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or think. I love that verse. Have you ever stopped and just looked at it for a couple of minutes? Paul's like, hey, our God is able to do something. He can do some stuff. And here's what our God can do. He can do far more abundantly. That's a big, fat, run-on phrase in the Greek. He didn't just say our God can do more than we can ask or think. He didn't just say our God could do far more than we can ask or think. Paul's like, I got to think of some words so these people will get it. Our God can do some stuff. He can do far more abundantly than anything, that's a lot, than anything we can ask for. Are you teaching your people to ask big things of God? Did y'all catch that? Are you teaching your people, the ministers, as the part of the body of Christ, are you teaching them to ask big things of God? Our God is able to do far more abundantly than anything they could ask for. And it keeps going. Our God's able to do far more abundantly than anything we can ask or even think of. That person sitting in your pew, what's the biggest thing they could ever imagine God could use them to do for the glory of God and the kingdom? God's able to do far more abundantly than anything they could even imagine or think of. Your people have inside of them right now the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They have inside of them the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do they know that? And are you releasing them into the harvest for them to use that power? So I'll start landing the plane with this. What kind of church are you? And what kind of church are you becoming? What kind of church are you? And what kind of church are you becoming? A couple of options. You can become one of those churches that you build your building, you have Sunday services, you run your programs. And you grow. It's awesome. You grow maybe a few hundred people, maybe a few thousand. You see baptisms. You see salvations. And, and, and if you do that, look, you, you will make a huge difference in a lot of people's lives. You'll make a huge difference in a lot of people's lives. A lot of people get cared for. A lot of people will hear the word of God preached. A lot of people be ministered. A lot of people be pointed to Jesus every single Sunday. But what if you did all those things 
but you added just a little bit something else. What if, what if, and here's just another idea for you. Over the next 20 years, you build that building, you, you start the programs, you do all that stuff. Maybe, maybe you grow to a few hundred, maybe you grow to a few thousand, it doesn't really matter, but what if the other path that you take is not just to reach some people for Christ there in your community, but what if you reach some people for Christ in your community and then you train them and equip them and you send them out and over the next 20 years, you, your church plants like 20 other churches or 40 other churches. And that becomes what you celebrate. And not only do you bring, you know, get people to come to your church and they hear Christ, but you plant 20 churches, but you send out 200 missionaries from your church to unreached people group. You're like, Matt, that's nuts. I've seen God do it through my church. It's like 312 or something. God can do it. There is a pent up desire in the body of Christ to get in the fight. I'm telling you, there is a pent up desire in the body of Christ to get in the fight. Pastors, church leaders, it's your job. It's your biblical calling to equip them for the work of ministry and for crying out loud, let them go do it. And that 20 churches that you plant, what if they planted 20 and they planted 20 and they planted 20 and one of those 200 missionaries you sent, they start reaching a bunch of hundreds of missionaries, that thing starts compounding pretty significantly. And if you'll do that, if you'll do that, not hard, but if you'll do that, a couple things are going to happen. Number one, the sun will never set on the ministry of your church. Think about that. Because your church isn't confined to one city and one building. The sun will never set on the ministry of your church because you've got people that you've sent out all over the world for the glory of God. Number two, your church will outlive you. Its effectiveness will outlive you. It won't die with you. And again, you won't just change a few people's lives, but you'll change the world. Last thing I want to do, I'm going to show you a picture. Tell you what it is here, and then I'm going to pray. A picture was actually given to me. It's uh, years ago when I was at the Austin Stone. This is in East Texas, real close actually to where I grew up in East Texas. It's called Cedar Creek Lake. This picture was taken in 1902. And the pastor on the left has got a really cool beard. Um, his name is uh, Jeremiah Benjamin Moon. It's a cool name. He was the great, great grandfather or great grandfather of one of the folks in my church. And I think I just framed this thing and gave it to him and said, Matt, I'd love for you to have it. I keep it in my office. And I see it every day as I'm writing sermons. And the reason that I decided to keep it in my office right there where I can see it and be reminded of its message every day. It's because something hit me one time when I was checking this, checking this picture out. And I, when it hit me, I'm like, I need to remind myself of that every single day. And I was looking at it, and I, and I look at it, pretty much every time I see this picture, I always see something different. There's one little kid somewhere in the back, you can probably, and he's smiling. He's the only person smiling in the whole picture. And I don't know why people didn't smile back then, but this one little kid was smiling, and when his mom saw the picture, probably beat him down. But it's, it's amazing. I always see something different every single time. And I was looking at this picture one day, just kind of studying it. And it, it's, it's a cool picture when you study it. These are all people. They're at a baptism service. A lot of the folks in the front, they're young. They've come to Christ. They're getting baptized. Their family and friends are there. They've got their whole lives in front of them. And something hit me one day like a ton of bricks. There's actually one thing that every single solitary one of these people in this picture have in common. Do you see it? The one thing that every single one of these people have in common is they're all dead. They, they, they look so alive. They were. They had their whole lives in front of them. But at some point in time, in the next few years, they passed away. They went home to be with Jesus. The reason that I put this in my office is because I want to remind myself that my time to make a dent on the Great Commission is short. It's short. We have just a few short years to make our mark 
on the Great Commission. And then we're going to hand the torch to another generation. Let's stop defining success by how many people we can get to come to our church. Let's start defining it by how many people we can get to come to our church, be trained and equipped and sent out into a nation and a world that desperately needs it. Okay? Let's pray. Father, to do this is not easy. It means sometimes that we lose our best from our church. Sometimes it means we that our, our best friends go somewhere else, to another city, to another country. Sometimes it means, God, that our budget goes down because some of our best givers get the call to go to some crazy place for the glory of your name, Lord. It's not easy. And so, God, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that you would move in hearts of church leaders today to realize that you are worthy. God, you're worthy of whatever it is that we hand over to you. God, I pray for Vintage Conference. I pray for the churches represented. God, that tonight we would change our definition of success. We would change the definition of success to what you say is the definition of success. Lord, I pray that you would move in power. God, I sense so deeply that everybody in this room longs for you, longs for your presence and your power. Lord, would you show up among us, in us, and through us. And we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we spend some time in response and singing. I think it's appropriate for us to just stop and consider for a moment. Last night, we spent some time in God's Word, hearing and thinking about how to care for our own souls, how to consider the call on our life in ministry and in service to our call to be followers of Jesus. And tonight, Matt brought to us an appropriate call to care for our churches. And a call to care for our churches in a way in how we think of them, how we hold them, and how we lead them. Is it our church or is it God's church? Is it our ministry, is it our ambition, or is it God's plan and his design and his glory so I just think it's appropriate and we we trust God in this conference and how he leads his people and how he leads his servants to come and bring and I'm thankful for a prophetic word tonight of a warning that is so important to us on a truth that we are so concerned about that success is not about us and our thing and our numbers and our size but our desire is to see him magnified. So I don't, I don't, I don't know how it's where the Spirit is working tonight, but I, I trust when the Word of God is proclaimed that the Spirit is working. And I think it's appropriate for us to just take a, a moment and to consider for ourselves, before our Savior, before our Father, before our God, regardless of the scope of our ministry, the thing that we are trying to build, our team, our campus, our church. That God would work to realign our thoughts in the definition of success. Not just to get a better strategy, but to bring him glory through our pursuit and our service. So let's just take a moment here in our seats. Just bow your heads, if you would. Just ask God to, through his spirit, to bring to mind ways and opportunities that as you serve him, as you lead his church and his people, that you're leading them to the thing that he loves and desires. And that is a message and a ministry and a gospel that goes beyond our years.
Matt's not concerned with the size of our churches. He's concerned with the heart of what we've been stewarded and entrusted with. God, we've gathered here this week to be equipped. And the equipping work is sometimes surgery work. So root out, God, in us anything that would hold us back from being a people, a movement, a church, a leader that is open-handed with what all you, what you have given us that we would be motivated as your people and as your servants uh, to bring back the maximum investment from what you have given us that will never be defined within the walls of the building that we have, but will be seen in the advancement of your kingdom around the world. God, we believe tonight that you are patient and that's why you have not returned. We believe that there are more people in this town and in this city and state and country and this world and people groups who have never heard the gospel who need people to go. So God, tonight in the, in the quiet of this moment, God, would you send and would we let go? We are your servants. We go where the master leads. We respond as the spirit leads. So we trust you, spirit. Do your work. We want you to be glorified. In Jesus' name.